good morning. It is great to see you and your smiling face. If you're not smiling, would you just smile this way? If not for me, to the choir. Amen. That looks so much better. Amen. amen. Look at your neighbor and say amen. amen. We're going to worship this morning. We've already worshiped today. Uh, God, I read this verse a, a couple of weeks ago and God led to me to it today. Isaiah 25, 1. Listen to the words of this scripture. Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you and praise your name. For in perfect faithfulness you have come. And you have done wonderful things. Things planned long, long ago. We serve a faithful God. We're going to sing about that today and just worship him in spirit and truth. And uh, I'm going to ask you to stand as we sing victory in Jesus. Here we go, church. Celebrate it. You may be seated. 
Amen. Well, man, what a great way to start our worship time. Good morning, church. Good morning. Great to see you. So glad to have everybody joining us on the live feed as well. Or maybe you're watching from some remote place later on in the week because maybe you're out of town. With it. It's spring break time for many of our families. If that's the case, man, good for you for stopping just a little while to, to worship, to get caught up some, and to dig into God's Word. So we're going to be doing that in just a bit. Let me share with you a few things just as reminders, all right? Especially if you're our guest today, we'd love to know a little bit more about you and how we can reach out to you and let you know about the different things that are going on here in our church family and so uh, and how it might affect you, especially as we get closer to Easter. We have some things coming up that we want to allow our kids and families to be a part of. And so there are some cards like these in the the racks and the seats around the worship center, around the sanctuary. So if you want to, just use that as a tool to communicate with us. If you're new to the community or to our church family, we'd love to know some things about you and be able to have some information to reach out. We don't put these on some solicitation lists or sell the information like some. We keep that for in-house, our in-house needs. Also, if you've got a if you've moved, you've got a new address, a new email address, a new cell phone number or something, uh, we won't find that out normally unless you let us know. So please use that as well. You can just say, hey, new number or new address. And maybe most importantly, there's a place on there to also share with us any prayer needs that you have or prayer concerns, whether it be something very private for your own family and you just want to give us some general information or something very specific. We, uh, we, we, share, we do share that now with our, with our uh, staff members, our team members, uh, the, the various groups that meet uh, during the week and want to know, hey, how can we pray for people? We share that information with them. If you're watching through the live stream today and you want to just give us some prayer needs or concerns, or even if you just want to say hello through that uh, live chat, please feel free to do that, and we'll see those comments and also... Uh, remember, and keep in mind that a lot of people are seeing that. So if you share with this information, just be comfortable with what you share. All right? You know, in just a little while, we're going to be looking at a story in Mark chapter 12. So on Sunday mornings, we've been looking at the gospel of Mark. And in the story that we'll see today, Jesus is, uh, is sitting in an area of the temple. And he's watching people as they come by. And he's specifically observing the offerings that they put in these baskets that they had in the area for people to publicly see. So, you know, back then they couldn't just go online privately or even put it in an envelope and give it to their Sunday school teacher. With everybody watching, they all walked by and placed their tithes and offerings in these baskets for all to see, and Jesus was watching as well. And we'll, we'll see some interesting things that he points out about what one person in particular placed in those baskets. But it's a reminder that, that this is how we in our church family can give as well. So if you want to give offerings and, and tithes, you might do that online. You might do that through your Sunday school class. But if you miss those chances, as you come in and leave, there are baskets at each of the exits. And that's what those are for. You can drop the information cards in there if you'd like. And certainly your, any, any offerings or, or gifts that you give, you can use those baskets. And that's what they're there for as well. Well, we're anticipating God doing some special things through his presence and through his word today in your life and in mine. And so let's go to him as we continue our worship time. Father, may it be true of us today and every day that before we think about a tangible gift that we can give from our bank account or our possessions, I pray, Lord, that we'll understand today the importance of giving you our, our life and our heart and our all first. Lord, would you show us specifically, personally, everybody in this place, everybody watching from another location or listening, would you show us each personally what it means to give our best and to give our all to you. What it looks like for me, Lord, to love you with all of our with all my heart, my soul, my mind, and my strength, and to love my neighbor as myself. 
And Lord, when it comes to showing generosity as a part of what's in my heart, I pray that you'll find me faithful. I pray, Lord, today that you'll find us faithful in this very important area. And Lord, where where I am self-centered, where we are self-focused in the abundance that you provide for us, I pray, Lord, today that you'll use your word to show us a better way and a kingdom-centered way and a Jesus-centered way. And Lord, I'm so grateful that You've placed people in the Bible, anonymous to us, but known to you, that can give us such a wise example and pattern to follow of what it means, really, to have a Christ-centered and a gospel-centered life. For it's in Jesus' name we pray.
good to be reminded of his faithfulness. Amen? Amen. And what an opportunity. What else can we do but give him all of our praise, all of our thanks. Thanks for all he's done and all he'll continue to do. If you're able this morning, let's stand and continue to worship. Please. 
our many mansions and you're preparing a place for us even as we praise you today I am chosen not for sin
bless you. Amen. Give him praise today, church. God bless you. You may be seated. I praise God. Mm -mm -mm. My goodness. Hey, I'm just curious. How many of you, I'm um, going to include myself in the group. How many of y'all needed to hear about God's faithfulness today? Would you just raise your hand for me? How many of you, like me, I can't hear about God's faithfulness enough. Can you raise your hand if you agree with that statement? You know, I know he's faithful. It's not like we need to be reminded of it. I just love to hear it. And I, and I love to say it. And you know something else? God loves it when we say it as well. Anytime that you and I speak back to him things that, that are true about his nature and true about his character, he loves it. I'm just, and, and when, we, when we acknowledge that even in a, in a public setting, that's like another way to praise and another way to honor him. So how many of you are so glad that we got grace for today and bright hope for tomorrow? Would you raise your hand? Amen. You know what? That was a nice little golf clap, wasn't it? That was just a nice, that was a nice little golf clap. Next week at the Augusta, at Augusta National, that'd be really good. Can we just thank God for his faithfulness today by really doing a good job? Can we just thank him for his faithfulness? Amen. My goodness. Mm -mm -mm. My goodness. I just needed to hear that word today. Well, here's another thing that I want to remind you of, all right? You know what? They say time flies while you're having fun. How many of y'all know time flies whether you're having fun or not? Can I get a, can I get an amen? On that one right there. And you know what? Four years passes pretty quick, doesn't it, too, John? Doesn't it pass pretty quickly for you? Can y'all help me thank God for four-year anniversary of John Wells, the servant of Faith Baptist Church? <laughs> Amen. That's right. <laughs> and was it yet? Specifically, what, yesterday? Probably, what was the date, actually? Do you even know? Friday. Yeah, yeah, April Fool's Day. Okay. Well, uh, you said that, not me, bro. So, but happy anniversary, John. We thank the Lord for you, man. Absolutely. Well, let's take our Bibles and find Mark chapter 12 in our study on Sunday morning. That's, uh, that's just where we are. But this story, everybody, I don't know about you if, you, if you grew up and your family took you to church like ours did, you know, back in the day, I remember this story ever since my childhood just because it's so different, right? It's so unique and so profound in many ways. And it's just one more example where some of the most profound lessons in all of Scripture come from people that we don't even know their names. You know, just these anonymous, special, precious people. Sometimes we learn from their negative examples. Sometimes, like today, though, they're, they're positive ones, and that's certainly true. Now, keep in mind now that where the context of this has taken place, as Jesus has just, he's, he's using some teachable moments, really some um, interactions, some, some confrontations that he's having with his, his uh, most vocal adversaries, most vocal critics. And in that context, one of them asks, you know, Jesus, what do you think is the greatest commandment of all? And Jesus says, well, it's to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all, and I'm going to emphasize that word all because Jesus mentions it several times, all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. And then, as if Mark just steps in and says, I think that I'm going to just explain, I'm going to share this story on the heels of that teaching by Jesus. Love God with all you have and also love your neighbor as yourself. He says the second greatest one. Love God with everything that we have. Love our neighbor as ourself. And then Mark says, by the way, here's what happens next. Let's just begin in verse 38. In his teaching, he was saying, uh, beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and like respectful greetings in the marketplaces and chief seats in the synagogues and places of honor at banquets. So Jesus is mentioning people who, who like to be seen by others and who like to be affirmed, you know, and applauded by others. Jesus goes on and says, those same people, those very same people that do those what looks like religious actions Here's what they're really about. He says in verse 40, they devour widows' houses and for appearances sake offer long prayers. These will receive greater condemnation. 
And then Mark writes, he sat down, that is Jesus, sat down opposite the treasury and began observing how the people were putting money into the treasury and many rich people were putting in large sums. A poor widow came and put in two small copper coins which amount to a cent. Calling his disciples to him, he said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all the contributors to the treasury. For they all put in out of their surplus, but she out of her poverty put in all she owned, all she had to live on. I had a conversation with another pastor this week who was telling me that he, a church that he used to serve had a, a coach in his family. Um, if I mentioned the coach's name, many people would recognize that he was sort of a high profile um, player and then a coach. And then he got a major contract and offer to come to a, a very large, prominent uh, SEC school to coach basketball. So his salary, was still was a good salary at the smaller school where he was but his salary got bumped up several times when he went to the larger SEC school his contract was for 1.2 million dollars a year and this is several years ago I mean that's still nothing to sneeze at you know what I'm saying but it, it, it even be more than that in today's dollars but it was 1.2 million dollars and this pastor told me that this uh, coach and his wife were were devout followers of Jesus they were very active in in his church and they were very generous people as well and they believed in the biblical principle of tithing giving a tenth of one's income and so she the wife called my pastor friend with a dilemma they were getting ready to move and she was saying pastor what what do we need to do because we want to continue to be generous but she said do you know what a tithe is off of what my my husband is going to be bringing home now. And she said, our tithe would be $8,000 a month. Pastor, that's a lot of money. Well, the truth was, it was the same percentage that they had been giving probably all along. But she was saying, dude, that's, that's starting to, you're starting to talk about some real, some real coin when you talk about $8,000 a month. And we, we were talking about it and kind of laughing. And my friend could have said, well, I can always pray that your salary stays the same and then you won't have to worry about it, you know. But he didn't do that. But when you start talking about percentages of giving and, and amounts that can be given and how much we've been blessed, especially in our nation, what is an appropriate gesture of generosity to God, who, by the way, doesn't need anything that I have, right? That's, that's not the point of, of giving anyway. This, this widow dropped in the two smallest coins in their currency at the time. What in the world good could that have done in a world that had all the needs that they had in the first century and we'll talk about that but the point of the story is not the amount that she gives and the point of the story is not even the impact that the gift makes because we don't know the specific place that she's giving it the point of the story seems to be from Jesus what is going on in this dear lady's heart and that's what I want to talk to you about today so we're just gonna look at several lessons from this story Beginning with this one. In God's economy, God uses the widow as well as the wealthy. All right? So if you want to fill in the blanks on your notes, this will be the first one. God uses the widow as well as the wealthy. So let's look at what's going on here. How, how is Jesus able to, to watch these people as they're giving their offerings anyway? Well, back in their day, this is how they did it. In the Jewish culture, okay, in the first century, they gave... Usually, at the, they could give in various ways, but normally they would give publicly in Jerusalem there at the temple. And in the temple, as, as you go, even, even today, as you go into the, the place where the western wall, the old remaining western wall of the temple is, there are sections where, 
where Gentiles can go, people like me. You know, I'm not, I'm not Jewish of Jewish heritage. There are places there where only females can go, court of women. There are places where only men can go. And then the, the first century was a lot like that. So you would go into that, to the outer area, the outer courtyard of the temple. That was the court of the Gentiles. That's where anybody could gather. And that's where um, people would set up the tables, the buyers and the sellers, you know, that Jesus kind of went off on and drove them out and said, you're a den of thieves. That's that area. And then you go into the, the court of, of women that um, only men and women can go there, but no Gentiles, only people that are Jewish. And then you go into a little more exclusive, the next chamber in, and that's the court of men, where only Jewish men could go to. And then you go a little further in, and it's only priests who could go. And then a little bit further, only the high priest into the Holy of Holies on that Day of Atonement, one day of the year. So as you get closer and closer to the Holy of Holies, it's more and more exclusive. So the place that Jesus is, there's between that outer court, the court of the Gentiles, and the court of women where, where men and women can go, there's a gate that's called the Gate Beautiful, or the Beautiful Gate. And a lot of people believe that uh, that's where Jesus settled because there was a seating area there. Jesus, we believe, probably just sat down on a bench and began to watch people as they come by. And in that area of the temple, there were, uh, uh, first century historians tell us, that there were 13 baskets that were there. They were called trumpets because of the shape that they were in. And these 13 baskets were for different kinds of offerings. So they might be to, to pay for the special uh, sacrifices or expenses of the temple. It might be a basket to give to people who were living in poverty and needed help. It might be to buy corn or money or oil for sacrifices. And Jesus sits down, and we don't know which of these baskets that this lady placed her coins. That's not the point of the story. The point of the story is that it was all that she had. And if you put it in perspective, proportionately, Jesus is saying she gave more than all of these wealthy people who put in their large offerings because proportionally it was all she had. And we know a little bit about even what the amount was. Uh, the, the coins that were used in their day, the smallest coins, which seems to be the ones that she has, it was called a lepton. And a lepton was, uh, it, literally that word means a thin one. So the thinnest or the smallest little piece of, of, of metal, of coin, is what she was using. As far as its value is concerned, when the, at the time that Mark wrote this, uh, we're told that it was, it, a lepton was worth about 1 64th of a denarius. That's important because a denarius was one day's wages. But if you put it in today's dollars and cents, just so we know the value of what she put in, it was about one, one coin, one of these coins, she had two, one was about, worth about one-eighth of a penny. Okay, I went in two or three places this week and paid with cash and was asked if it was okay if they didn't give me pennies back because people just don't have them anymore. They're, they're of so little value in our culture that folks are merchants and People that are, that are in charge of those kinds of things won't even take those offline. They're of so little value. Well, this lady's coin, one of them was about one-eighth of that. But Jesus applauds the, the purity of her heart. We know it wasn't because of the amount itself. And we know it wasn't because God needs or needed her money. He doesn't. He owns it all. He needs something. He just finds it or creates. He could create it again if he wanted to. And he never runs out of resources. So in this case, it's, it's her generosity that gets the attention of Jesus. And you know something in Scripture? Jesus is not impressed by very much. He's impressed by faith, and he points that out. And he also points out this dear lady's gesture as well. So these lessons, God uses the widow as well as the wealthy. And I, I hope that that is a complete encouragement to everybody who's listening to my voice right now. Because when you think about it, most people, in, in our context, okay, and most people in, in North America anyway, there's, a, there's, kind of, there's kind of a curve. And relatively speaking, there are very few people that live in absolute poverty. And 
there are very few people who, by our standards at least, are very, very wealthy. Now, by the world's standards, let's just talk about that for a second. By the world's standards, virtually everybody in this place would be wealthy. Because we're, 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 we're not hungry right now. You may be in 30 minutes or so, but I hope you're not right now. So you're, you're not hurt. You got, you've got clothes on your back. Probably had to stand and, and stare into your closet last night or this morning deciding what you were going to wear. A lot of people in the world don't have that problem. Follow me? So by, by those standards, then we're all very wealthy. We, can even, we have the liberty to give people resources if we feel led and we feel like there's a need. Most of us here can do that at least to a small degree. That's not the point, though. The point is, in our world, in our world, wealth, listen now, wealth means influence in our world. It does. And there are some people that, that look at you differently if they perceive you as a wealthy or a well-off person. We just, that's just the world we live in. And what's true, here, here's what I mean. A person that's very, very wealthy, they... Um, can support a political candidate, candidate, and sometimes that gives a person leverage. They can help other people provide for their basic needs, even in developing countries. A few years ago, I went with a group to, to Cuba, all right? And Cuba, especially at that time, uh, kids, you know, you're, you, you can have a Bible. You got several Bibles maybe in your home, or uh, you got a family Bible sitting around, and you come to uh, church and there are Bibles there. Well, in Cuba, they don't have, or, or and in communist nations, a lot of they don't have just Bibles the way that that you and I do. They just go pick one up and start reading those Bible stories. And so we went to the home of a of a pastor who had a little church that met in his house, and he had a printing press, you know, a printing machine in the back of his house that they were printing up copies of the Gospel of John, and it was against the law there. So that means if he was found out that they would, they would destroy that machine and put him and maybe some of his family members in jail. So there are people that, that from here, from the United States, that help that pastor make sure that printer's working, buy paper, buy ink to put those Bibles together. Things like that that happen in the world, they just cost money to do, right? So if you look at the, another extreme of that, nations that are perceived as wealthy, prosperous nations have a lot of influence in our world. So what that means is a country like the United States or China has more influence or leverage sometimes in our world than some of the smaller countries like in Africa or Asia. That's just the way that wealth and, and money works. But now I wanna, I wanna share this part to you that some people miss. Money, is not evil in and of itself. And the Bible never says that money is the root of all evil. And a lot of people quote that as if it comes from Scripture that is not in the Bible. Here's where that misquote comes from. It's 1 Timothy 6.10. And Paul wrote, For the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil. And some, by longing for it, have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. So, what that means is that in and of itself, money is an inanimate object. It's like a lot of other things. You can use it for evil, and you can use it for good. But what you do with it says something about your heart. Whether you're a poor widow like this woman is, or somebody who's very wealthy. Here's the interesting thing. Did you know that at least statistically and historically, it's true that sometimes the people that are the least resourced actually can be the most generous. Not always. Now listen, please don't leave here and think that I said, hey, if, if you know, poor people are more generous than those who are wealthy. That's not the case. Again, this is a matter of a person's heart. It's not a matter of how much they have. I'll give you another example. Sometimes I've heard people say, well, you know, if... If God just blessed me like he blessed them, I'd be more generous. Can I just say respectfully? No, you wouldn't. Because it's not a matter of what you have. It's a matter of what you, what's in your heart and what you do with what you have. So if, you're, if you have a heart of generosity, people that have a heart of generosity find a way to be generous towards someone else and even to do it in the name of Christ. 
and people who aren't don't if they have a little or they have a lot but here are the facts that I want to share with you okay so I think this says more about what we can be tempted of when we're prosperous than it does the actual amount that we might have so listen to these stats this is according to the generosity index that's that's uh, put out by the catalog of philanthropy all right so this is based on the average gross income of, 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 of like they keep track of this stuff by states so the, the here's the, the reality is that the states traditionally the states that have the lowest per capita average gross income are actually ranked the highest in the index of generosity for example Mississippi our neighboring state since 1995 they've ranked about 49th or 50th on average in the gross average income but they constantly are ranking number one or number two highest in itemized charitable contributions Alabama we rank 37th or 38th usually in average gross income we rank about fifth or sixth among all states in the in our nation of the highest in uh, the the uh, itemized charitable contributions so what that should tell us is that at least the temptation is there to not be as generous the more resources we have the more wealth we have but in God's economy he can use the widow as well as the wealthy the second lesson is God recognizes the cost and not the amount look at what Jesus said he said this widow has given more than all the others not because of the amount but because she gave everything that she had to live on some of the uh, offerings that these wealthy people were giving it really didn't cost them much it cost this woman because she was trusting God as she gave it to help her live because she gave what she had to live on her actions actually if you think about it they they put they put uh, actions or 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 um, have a, a habit into what Jesus had said they should do to love God with all their heart soul mind and strength and this is a gesture of her loving God with all she had she put in all that she had to live on and by the way she actually does without being asked to do what the rich young ruler earlier in the gospel was required to do by Jesus or asked to do by Jesus and refused to do and he had a lot more wealth right he said Jesus what do I do to inherit eternal life what do I do to enter the kingdom of God Jesus says sell everything that you have and give it to the poor now we don't know for sure that she gave this to the poor but it was all she had and she wasn't asked to do it God recognizes the cost and not the amount you know it's another example let me share this truth with you about about giving and um, those of you that have been doing this a while know that this is true and, uh, and, and kids, as you think about giving, either now or later on, I want you to just remember this lesson. Because when we give in a generous way, because God has prompted our heart to do it, and we, especially if we're giving it to something that's going to advance the kingdom, giving is it, more about what it does inside of us than what it does where the gift is going to go. God could provide what people need from lots of different places, but he wants to do a work inside of our heart first Jesus said this Jesus said where your treasure is there your heart will be also and the other part you can turn it around where your heart is there your treasure will be also that's also true so there's a story I, I, I want to talk to you about David and Saul and kind of the contrast in those two kings very very wealthy they both came from pretty humble means um, but God used them, especially in their day. They, they went to the, to the top of the mountain, all right, and were given so much. But they did what, what, what that position and wealth did inside of them was very different in each case. So there's a story. It's recorded in 2 Samuel 24. I'm just going to summarize it, okay? David, 
there, there's, there's a plague that's coming, and, and David and his people are asking God, protect us from that. Remove that from us. And David wants a place to offer a sacrifice, a burnt offering to God as he's praying for that. And he, he wants to provide that offering on this threshing floor that's owned by another, a, a man in the kingdom, one of the subjects in the, in the kingdom. And, he, and this man sees David and his people coming, okay? And he wonders, what in the world does the king want with me? What in the world does the king want that, that I have? And so David says, I want to buy that threshing floor from you. I want to make a, build an altar and make a sacrifice. And the man says this, no, no. He says, you're the king of our kingdom. You're God's anointed. Anything you want, it's yours. Okay, so this man is trying to be generous to the king, and he knows that by being generous to God's man, the king, that he's actually being generous to God. So this is evidently a devout man. And he says to David, no, you're the king. I could never make you pay for this. You take whatever you want. If you want that threshing floor, it's yours. And I'll even give you oxen. I'll give you wood to burn on the altar. I'll give you anything that you need. And David could have received it, and it would have been probably okay as far as, we were con uh, as, far as people are concerned. But I want you to hear, David refused to receive that and said, no, no, I'm going to pay you for that. And I want you to hear why I think this is really profound when it comes to our need to give as Christians, okay? Here's what David said. This is recorded in 2 Samuel 24, 24 and 25. He said, however, the king said to Arana, no, but I will surely buy it from you for a price. Listen, for I will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God, which costs me nothing. So David's attitude was, no, I, I want this offering, this sacrifice to cost me something. It needs to cost me something. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. That's a lot of money back in their day, by the way. And David built there an altar to the Lord, and he offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. Look. Thus, the Lord was moved by prayer for the land, and the plague was held back from Israel. Listen, God does not want our leftovers. He wants our offerings to cost us something. Third lesson, God wants our heart and not just our offering. This dear lady one day, you know, we, we may meet her in eternity. We may meet her in heaven and know a whole lot more about her story. Until then, we just know that it was the fact that she gave everything that she had that moved the heart of Jesus. I heard once about a high jumper, that collegiate high jumper who was unable to get over this certain height over the bar. He tried, he tried, he kept knocking the bar down. He finally went to his coach and said, Coach, I'm not going to be able to get that height. And the coach said, Yes, you can. You just have to throw your heart over the bar and everything else follows. And that's true when it comes to giving, when it comes to serving, when it comes to, to helping our neighbor that Jesus said is an expression of how much we love God. It's just that when our heart is someplace, then the other things, including our giving, our generosity follows. So, another story about, about Saul. Saul started out in a humble place. He was a humble king. He evidently was dependent upon God, but that changed over the course of time. And he got greedy and, and powerful and paranoid and even started going to other places and substituting his need for God. And Samuel, who had anointed him as king of Israel and God had used him to anoint him, and who would also find and anoint King David as well. Samuel was warning Saul because he could, he could just kind of see what was coming. And he was telling Saul, Saul, you need to trust God. You need to do what he says, even if it doesn't always make sense. And so Saul told Samuel to, uh, God told Samuel to tell Saul to go and to, and, to, and to strike some of their arch enemies, the Amalekites. And to basically just level everything, destroy everything, not even to leave animals alive. So we can, we can get into the, what 
what all that says uh, about, about God's nature and what he was saying at the time, that's just a different discussion. The fact is, whether Saul understood it or not, whether we understand that or not, that's what he told Saul to do. And he's God and we're not. And so Saul carried out the plan, sort of. <laughs> and so can you, you know what I mean when I say partial obedience is the same as disobedience, right? So this is partial partial obedience, but not complete, so it was disobedience. Now, this, this, this narrative is a little bit lengthy, but I really want to share it the way that it's told to us in Samuel, in 1 Samuel, so please listen. This is 1 Samuel chapter 15. It says, Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel, saying, listen now, God said to Samuel, I regret that I have made Saul king. How terrible a thing to say. I mean, that God's sorry that he even made Saul king. It says, why? Because he has turned back from following me and has not carried out my commands. And Samuel was furious. And he cried out to the Lord all night. Samuel got up early in the morning to go and meet Saul. And it was reported to Samuel saying, Saul came to Carmel. And behold, he set up a monument for himself, and then he turned and proceeded on down to Gilgal. So Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said to him, and so look, Saul is clueless now about how God feels about him right now. He thinks he's done an awesome job because they've won the battle. So Saul says to Samuel, Blessed are you of the Lord. I have carried out the command of the Lord. But Samuel said, Then what is this bleeding of the sheep in my ears? He's saying, Man, what's this bellowing of the oxen which I hear? Saul, I thought all of these animals were supposed to be killed. Why do I hear sheep? Why do I hear mooing in the background? And then Saul's like, Uh-oh. And so Saul says, Well, they, they have, they, not me, they, the people, they have brought them from the Amalekites for the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God. Now look, this is where we, we try to get in there and figure stuff out for God, right? Surely God didn't mean what it sounded like he said because this makes more sense to me. And Saul's thinking, surely God would have spared the best animals, the best cattle. We got to make sacrifices though, right? So here's the bottom line. Saul's not wanting to do what God wants him to do. Saul's wanting to do what Saul wants to do. That ought to be a real, a real warning, a real check in our spirit to avoid the same thing. So he says, they, they brought them to me, but the rest, now the rest, Samuel, we completely destroyed. And then Samuel said to Saul, stop. <laughs> Can you see him? Just stop. He says, let me inform you of what the Lord has said to me last night. And the king said, speak. And Samuel said, it is not true, or is it not true that you were insignificant in your own eyes, that you became the head of the tribes of Israel? For the Lord anointed you as king over Israel, and the Lord sent you on a mission and said, go and completely destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, Fight against them until they're eliminated. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? And by the way, Saul also kept the king of the Amalekites alive, which he wasn't supposed to do. Instead, Samuel says, you loudly rushed upon the spoils and did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Then Saul said to Samuel, I did obey the voice of the Lord. For I went on the mission on which the Lord sent me, and I have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and have completely destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took up some of the spoils and sheep and oxen, the choicest of the things designated for destruction, to sacrifice to the Lord your God at Gilgal. And Samuel said, this is the part we really need to be a wake-up call for you and me. Samuel says, does not the Lord have as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. And to pay attention is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as reprehensible as the sin of divination. That's, kind of, that's, like, that's like fortune telling, working with the supernatural. And insubordination is as reprehensible as false religion 
and idolatry. Since you have rejected the word of the Lord, he also rejected you from being king. You know, when your kids, were real, those of you that have, have had little kids or you got grandkids, don't you tell them some things sometimes that you know is the best and you know it's the best for them, but they just don't understand it. And they want a reason, and so they ask why. How many of you know that they're really not asking you why when they ask that question? You don't sit down, a six-year-old, and say, well, I'll, let me just explain this to you. And I'm sure once I explain it, you'll say, oh, thank you, mother. Thank you, father. That makes complete sense to me now. So I agree 100% with that decision. No, they just don't want to do that thing. Or they want to do it their own way. The same way that you and I did when our parents told us to do things that didn't make sense to us. Now look, some of the things that God's going to lead us to do may or may not make complete sense to you and me. The prophet Isaiah said that God's ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And there are going to be some things that God commands you and me to do that are going to make complete sense because you have a heart for the kingdom, just like he does. But there will also be other things because he's, he's wiser, he's been around a whole lot longer than, than us, and he's got his agenda in mind over ours. There are always going to be some things that don't make complete sense. Some of you may be in dating relationships that don't honor God. And God's going to move your heart to say, this is not good. This could lead to something that's toxic. This could lead you away from me. But you're going to say, oh no, but Lord, he makes me happy. She makes me happy. And I know that we can make this work. Some of you are going to be moved to go to places that are going to make you feel uncomfortable. Or release somebody in your family to go someplace that's going to make you feel very, very uncomfortable. And the question is going to be, are you going to do what makes sense to you? Or are you going to just say yes to God and trust him for the results? That's the real question. And what this lady is doing in part with her gesture is, she by giving everything that she has in some ways is saying, I'm going to just go ahead and give this because God's leading me to do it and I'm trusting him to provide the things that I need. That must be, I don't know what she's thinking, but it must be something like that. If it was for any other self, if it was for a selfish reason, she wouldn't be commended by Jesus. Again, back to part of the story of David, you know, when, when Saul had made those decisions and God had really rejected him because of his disobedience and idolatry and actions. God says, I've got, I've got somebody else out there that I'm, that I'm prepared. And Samuel goes to Bethlehem, and God sends him to the home of Jesse. And Jesse's got seven sons, not counting David. David's the runt. David's the youngest. He's out in the field. And uh, he must have started, he kind of, uh, Jesse must have started with the, with the oldest, the, the tallest, maybe the, the, the ruddiest, the, the, one that, the, the, the one that you would expect maybe could be king. Um, when he brings him in front of Samuel, God says to Samuel, that ain't him. I said, he's not the one. And he tells this to Samuel, 1 Samuel 16, 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or the height of his stature, because I've rejected him. For God does not see as man sees, since man looks at the outward appearance, the Lord looks at the heart. Now let's, uh, let's just admit something about David. He was not perfect, not even close. But overall, God wanted to use him, whatever the cost. There's a story about when, when uh, Russia was um, invading Finland back in 1939. And they were coming into that, to a, to, a, to a region in Finland. And so the Finns were evacuating people out from, out from Finland. Um, and as they were doing it, they were burning homes because they didn't want them to fall into the hands of the Russians. And they went into this home of one widow, an elderly woman, and they said, you're going to need to leave, ma'am and spend a few hours, pack up your things, and then we're going to come and we're going to burn your home down because we don't want the, it falling into Russian hands. 
So they left and they came back a few hours later and the, the elderly woman was on her hands and knees scrubbing her floor. And they thought maybe she didn't understand. And they said, ma'am, listen, you need to understand your home is going to be burned, so you need to leave. And here's what she said, yes, but if I must give it for my country, I want it to be the best I have to give. This lady in the story is given the best she has to give. <clears throat> so you've got some notes there. Let me just, to wrap this up, I'm going to give you how does God want us to give? Let me just mention a few things to you. First of all, he wants us to give faithfully. We talked about, we sang about great is thy faithfulness. God wants us to be faithful in this way. 1 Corinthians 4, 2 says, Moreover, it is required of servants that they be found faithful. Also, he wants us to give sacrificially. He wants it to, us, it to cost something. Now, when you give something to somebody that you love, a lot of times it doesn't, seem like a sacrifice. That's not our motivation, but it is because it costs us something. He also wants us to give cheerfully. Paul wrote to the church in Corinth that God loves someone who doesn't just give out of compulsion, but he loves a cheerful giver. And then he wants us to give consistently. That is, as a habit. <clears throat> I, you can rest assured this is not the first time that this dear lady in this story has given something of significance to the Lord. I want to share with you something that um, was given to, um, to Paige uh, a few days ago. Is that cross down there by you? Do I have the cross or just, I got the letter. Is the cross there? I got it. You're right. Here it is. <clears throat> uh, so somebody sent this to her the other day. Paige was speaking to a, a group a few weeks ago, and a lady who was there makes these little crosses. And she sent one with a note to Paige. I want to share the note to you because sometimes when we give, often when we give, it's not about somebody else. It's about what's going on in our heart. So I just want to share with you this little story. She says, dear friend, <clears throat> my husband, to Paige, in July 2015, my husband and I were taking a trip to Florida. <clears throat> I wanted to keep my hands busy, so I looked in my crafting closet and picked out this plastic canvas cross. I had all the material and thought it would be a nice endeavor. While in, she names the town, I attended my old Sunday school class, and we were asked, what have you picked up lately that you have not done for a while? Asked that question, came around to me. I said, you know, I've been making some crosses on this trip. I'm not sure why I'm making them, but I, I want to, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to do it. I don't know what I'm going to do with them, but it's fulfilling to make these crosses. <clears throat> she said, as we were driving home to Alabama... On Thursday, July 30th, I found out why I was making them. I got a phone call from my grandson that one of my one and only precious granddaughter, Brianna, Bree Bree, decided to leave this earth by suicide. She was only 17. She suffered from depression, bipolar, some other things. Such a big disease for such a little body. It gave me comfort that she had accepted Jesus. In her letter, she said that she just could not fake life anymore. She said she had an amazing mom. She said her mamo, me, and her papa, this her, her husband Clark, were her heroes, but she just wanted peace. The next month, I stayed with our daughter and I made crosses, lots and lots of crosses. It became my therapy and passion I've given them to all of our family members, friends, church family members. I gave them to my classmates at a class reunion. Every time I think of someone or meet someone new, I get their address and send them a cross of hope. I give them to people that I meet in waiting rooms, restaurants, and other places. She writes, I want to saturate this earth with these crosses. This is all I can do for my, daughter, my darling girl this side of heaven. I want to spread that love life and memory and spirit. I make them in loving memory of her and in honor of people who suffer from depression. Each stitch is made with love. I'm amazed that, I'm amazed that people tell me that it gives them peace and comfort. Please let me know if there's anyone that you would like to have a gift of a cross of hope. I will cherish your prayers 
for your family, from your family, love and, and blessings. And she signs it. That may look like a piece of canvas and a cross to you, but you know something? I think to Jesus it probably looks a whole lot like two small little coins. And while it might not be all she has, there's a lot of love that goes into that gift. Let me ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. <clears throat> I just want to ask, what, what are your two copper coins? What would be that gift that costs you something but that you need to give? And I would encourage you with this, and for everybody listening, everybody watching, please know this. We do not earn one bit of God's grace and favor by something that we give. But God desires you and me to respond to the greatest gift that he gave in his son. Father, I pray that anybody listening to our voice today who hasn't received the gift of your son and the love that you've shown us through him, that we would repent of our sin today and trust in Jesus as Lord and Savior. And I pray, Father, whatever you want us to give, whatever that widow's might might be for our lives, please show us, Lord. And may we be faithful in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand together. If anybody wants to come, you've got any need at all for prayer or something else, I'll be here to help any way I can as we sing. faithful, isn't he? This week, I pray that God gives you an opportunity to serve him by giving to others and that he'll change our hearts to where we'll be more like him. Don't forget that this Wednesday, is, uh, this next week is spring break. This Wednesday, we will not have any church activities uh, that day, Bible study or anything that evening. And pray that you spend time with your family. Maybe go visit somebody that needs you just to say, I love you and I've been thinking about you. Let's sing as we came in this uh, chorus of Victory in Jesus. Oh, victory in Jesus.